Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Homeworld Remastered. I'm gonna start this episode with the unboxing pictures of the collector's edition. Uh, it came a little bit late but it arrived nevertheless and I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of it. It has a nice keychain and the box itself looks pretty neat. Um, the art booklet is full of interesting stuff, some of which I'm going to read to you guys this episode because, well, you'll see later. It has some really nice artwork in it and it is very, very well done. And of course the little card where the CD key was on, which I'm not going to show you guys because haha, <laughs> I know better. And uh, yeah, underneath of all the little goodies that are in here is the main piece. And the main piece is of course the mothership itself, which is neatly packed away. So we have a little platform where we can put things on, as you're going to see right here. And then of course we have to put the mothership on top of it. And the neat thing about it is that it has LED lights installed, which light up the hangar bays and uh, engines, which you're going to see right here. There you go. If you're wondering, yes, that's Kerbal Space Program in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, here's a little view from the side. But let's jump into the episode itself, where it is a little bit more interesting. completed decrypting data from the enemy frigate we captured in the Karak system. It appears to be an Imperial broadcast. In order to stay clear of these outposts, our course will take us into a turbulent asteroid field and through the heart of a nebula. Hyperspace jump successful. Diamond Shoals. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Homeworld. We haven't cleared the asteroid field. Prepare for collisions. Incoming asteroids must be destroyed before they impact with the mothership. Concentrate fire within this collision envelope. Alright, so yeah, this uh, mission consists of shooting down asteroids before they crash into the mothership. Now, there's nothing too much I could talk about while doing this mission, so I thought, well, I'm not going to record any audio while playing this, and what I'm going to do is, with post-editing here, I have this neat little um, artwork book that I showed you guys at the beginning of the video, and it has some interesting uh, background information, and I thought, well, you guys are watching this here, I could read it to you. Uh, if you want, you can skip to the next episode or to the end of the episode, or you can actually listen to me read this. So, a question of origins. The debate over our past on this world reaches back through the entire documented history of civilization, a period covering over 1,300 years. The harsh conditions across the world, Karak, fueled the myths of other places in times where we did not have to spend so much of our strength on simple survival. While the issue of our distant past was primarily a religious matter, it wasn't until the dawning of the time of reason that advances in the biological and chemical sciences revealed a disturbing lack of commonality between the biomechanical makeup of that of most Karakid life. Ironically, it was the birth of the Amid movement with his many scientific breakthroughs that created a philosophical environment where the oldest myths and the newest theories could be wedded into what we now have accepted as the xenogenesis theory. Except for a small variety of bacteria and a single species of a small forager, our helix proteins are completely different from all other forms of life on Karak. We were left with no other choice but to a serious consider 
seriously consider the theory that we were aliens to this world. Of course, this answer only led to more questions. And now, the Xenogenesis question and early spaceflight missions. It was becoming more obvious that we, as a species, were relatively new to Carrick. However, this theory by itself did not bring peace to our world. The mechanism and reason for arrival was still being hotly debated, and was even cause for a theological revival, revival on the eve of our first orbital flights. The age of orbital exploration revealed the first clues that we were not indigenous to our planet. Once we had progressed to pilot flights, reports of unusual pieces of metallic debris in higher orbit soon led to dedicated retrieval missions with surprising results. While nothing larger than a handspan could be found, samples were brought down from orbit and soft landed in the high desert. Initial analysis made it obvious these were pieces of advanced manufactured and machine structures. Detailed atomic analysis revealed trace elements and isotope combinations unknown on Carrick, or as it was eventually discovered, anywhere else in the stellar system. This was yet another piece of the puzzle of our origins, but it did not truly confirm anything except that some kind of alien device or ship had once orbited our world. Though not decisive, the discovery of this tiny debris belt spurred great leaps in metallurgy and manufacturing simply by showing that exotic high tensile compo composite materials could exist. This in turn led to advances in propulsion, first with limited fissioning and unstable heavy elements and then with more viable hydrogen fusion power plants, as effective shielding systems became lighter and smaller. The combination of these technologies spurred out fledgling space program ever further and our first steps became leaps. We were poised on the threshold of space, looking outwards for answers, when a twist of fate turned our eyes back to the surface of our adopted world. The discovery of Kar Toba. In 1106, a powerful radar satellite was launched in the hopes of detecting larger debris belts elsewhere in our star system. A malfunction in its maneuvering jets caused the satellite to turn towards Carrick and scan the surface. Lakeup Jarasi, a technician on the project, noticed hundreds of signals scattered across the desert below, and one stronger than all of the rest. A quick analysis showed the powerful radar had penetrated the equatorial desert sand to a depth of 75 meters, and there were strong evidence of an ancient city centered around a large metallic structure. By 1110, enough science ministers had been convinced by convinced by repeated radar scans to allocate resources to an expedition into the Great Desert. Despite conditions that would don personnel in modern virus suits, <laughs> these first brace excavators managed to uncover what has come to be known as the first city, Kar Toba. While this discovery was the stuff that archaeologists dream of, even greater secrets revealed themselves when the central metallic structure was revealed to be the skeletal chassis of an advanced vessel. The virtually nothing of relevant substance remained except a vast array of structural beams. The real treasure lay in the shielded chamber be below the surface. While tracing the ancient maze of power cables during the first triad of 1112, engineers opened a shielded chamber containing the remains of an ancient ship's power plant. Painstakingly transported to the modern polar capital of Tyr, the ancient device was back engineered to provide another generation of breakthroughs in power and material sciences. But what catapulted our technology 500 years forward was the analysis of a module attached to the power plant. This device was nothing less than a solid state hyperspace induction module. In a decade of analysis, we were ready to take our first step back out into the galaxy. But it was not until 1135 that it was revealed just how far we had to go. The discovery of the power plant and hyperspace module was considered the gem of an ancient car to bar, and with them safely in research labs in the temperate poles, the old city was left in the hands of a few de dedicated archaeologists. They struggled to their work and some of the harshest conditions on Carrick. Led by a young woman named Meveth Sagal, they gave our entire civilization an answer and a goal as she pieced together the location of the mythical observatory temple of Kar Toba. Accidents left her to excavate the site nearly single-handedly, but when she opened the inner chamber, she recognized immediately the full import of what she found, etched on a single piece of black stone. The Guidestone 
Archaeologists at Galt had found something that was unremarkable to the casual eye, as it was monumental to the future of our people. When she studied the Tithon further, she discovered it had once been an ornately carved artifact that had been nearly destroyed by the intense heat. Whatever message had been originally intended to convey had long since been erased. Some distant ancestors had cast it through time as a message for generations to come. Etched into the upper surface is a simple diagram of our galaxy, and a single gauged line leading from a point on the rim to one deep in the galactic center, adjacent to a spot easily identifiable with Carrick's actual position in a single string of numbers that give a three-dimensional vector, and at the other end of the line in a single word, ancient but common to all dialects. Higara. Ho. The effect on our culture of this simple artifact, now known as the Guidestone, has been unprecedented. Our material scientists confirmed the age of the artifact at approximately 3000 years, and are assured that they can match the Guidestone to its systems of origin should we come across it. After a long history of struggle, strife and inter-clan warfare, the confirmation that Carrick was never our true home inspired an era of cooperation like none ever known. After the appearance of the derelict spacecraft, there was a period of intense inter-clan warfare. Clans fought savagely against each other to claim the rich resources held in the sands. But slowly, the message of the Guidestone took hold, as did the magnitude of the task that lay ahead. All the resources of the salvage fields would be needed for our great task. We have dedicated our entire industrial and scientific resources towards a single common goal. Returning to Higara, our homeworld. The Mothership. In the first triad of 1159, a final plan was accepted for the vessel that would follow the path indicated by the Guidestone. What had delayed the project for so long was simply that no one, neither astronomers nor religious leader, could say for certain what had brought us to Carrick, and so no none could say what an expedition would encounter. It was finally decided to build a vessel that was capable of establishing a new colony deep coreward. Known simply as the mothership, the vessel would be part carrier, part survey ship, part factory complex, and most importantly of all, the temporary home for millions of our people frozen in cryogenic sleep. It would have to be able to deal with the great unknown reaches of the galaxy and whatever discoveries or threats that might contain. It would be the greatest construction project in our history. Ministers from every clan abandoned their cloistered competitive policies and pooled over every resource to develop stratagems and designs and then allocate them to the various industrial hubs throughout the polar zones. In the meantime, clans that had been trailing the cutting edge in technology and production turned their efforts completely over to agricultural work, feeding those who were occupied by the construction effort. And now the construction challenges. The planned mothership was so massive that it took 20 years simply to build up the infrastructure required for the construction project. Even with all the material salvaged from the planet, vast resources were still required. Asteroids from the debris belt were bolted into a parking orbit around Carrick. Here, manned cutter ships used high-energy lasers to break these plant points into manageable sections that could be towed into a great maw of the phased disassembler array. The PDA used a series fusion torches to reduce the planetoid chunks into their component elements. Robotic material plants then combined these elements into whatever alloys and composites were required for the grand task at hand. Many of the lessons learned here were refined and implemented into the next generation of resource gathering ships that would serve the mothership itself. The next step was to construct the orbiting scaffold, where the mothership would be built. This framework took 10 years to complete and is the single largest structure ever built. New disciplines in macroengineering had to be created and put into practical, uh, practice just to complete the construction yard. The scaffold runs 25.6 kilometers long and is stationed in middle orbit around our world, easily visible from the planet's surface. It is the only moon that Carrick has ever known, and has been a natural fixture in the night sky for almost four generations now. Only the eldest of our people can remember a time when the skies were dark and there was no glittering lattice work to remind our people of their destiny. Over the next 25 years, the mothership slowly took from inside the scaffold, building up in layers from the center sections outwards, until the final layer of ceramic armor was laid down just last year. For the last eight decades, there have been over 10,000 technicians, along with another 25,000 robots, continuously working on this ship. 
Many of the fusion torches and material plants that broke down and processed the planetoids early in the construction program were cannibalized and incorporated into the mothership itself. During the course of the massive project, 2,357 personnel have given their lives for the future of our people, and their names have been engraved on our central hyperdrive core aboard the mothership. They will never be forgotten, and their brave spirits will precede this vessel into the gulf of the hyperspace. Now there is quite a lot of more texts and interesting things in the um, wonderful little booklet here and if you guys are interested I can make more episodes where I'm reading this to you. Just let me know so I know and I can make it. However there is not enough left in this episode to read any further so we'll just skip to the end of it. Detecting incoming Bentuzi vessel from the clearing ahead. The Bentuzi are visiting us again. Pursuing targets. Greetings. We have come to trade. Okay, what do you want to trade? Ah, drone technology. This technology is required by drone frigates to be able to launch and control their 24 armed drones. I'd like to accept the offer, but we're out of money. However, if we stall this production here, we got it. New research available. New Yay. for this dangerous and unpredictable region. Can you give us information that will guide us through the nebula? We hear nothing there. Even the tide end fear the great nebula. No one returns. Okay. Hmm. Hyperspace module fully charged. Technically, we can already jump to the next mission, and Reported. I think I'm going to do that as soon as I try to get as much of these asteroids as I can. So I'll see you guys in the next episode.